எல்லாருக்கும் வணக்கம் நான் நான் சிதம்பரம்ல பிறந்தேன் ஆனால் மூணு வயசுலேருந்து நான் தமிழ்நாடு விட்டுட்டேன் அதனால என்னோட தமிழ் ஒரு மூணு வயசு பையன் மாதிரி தான் இருக்கும் அதுக்கு பேரில் நான் உங்களுக்கு கூட இங்கிலீஷில் பேசுகிறேன் ஓகே ஸோ the organizers for arranging this but i especially want to thank the publisher and the translator uh, for bringing out a tamil edition of uh, gene machine and i can imagine that the translation uh, was not straightforward partly because it mixed a lot of very personal and idiomatic english uh you know showing sort of personal humor and personal relations uh, on the one side and with highly technical uh science on the other side that has to be translated and you heard about how he had to uh, almost invent uh technical terms uh in tamil so um thank you very much for for doing that so i i want to talk to you about the four themes in gene machine uh you know scientists when they often write memoirs or autobiography by the way this is not an autobiography it doesn't talk about my childhood or parents or any anything like that it's really focused mainly on the science and on a particular race for this for the structure of the ribosome but many scientists when they talk they in hindsight everything becomes uh, sort of rosy and very logical and so on and uh, the double helix was one book that uh, that went against that trend which is why uh, it made such an impression when it came out and so in in this book i talk about four things one is uh, the ribosome itself and and what its role is in biology the other is uh, my life as an outsider i'll i'll point out in how in many ways i've been an outsider uh, all my life Uh, except for the first 3 years as you know and and um the other is about the human messiness of science science is objective but scientists are human beings and they often have their egos and personalities they have jealousies they have ambition uh, all of the things that make us human they don't stop when we become scientists and uh So finally I I'd like to conclude with some uh, lessons from my own life in science. So first uh, let's talk a, a little bit about the ribosome. So you heard that you know uh, from uh, Mr. Stevens that um you know everybody has heard of DNA and we know all think we know what genes are uh, but the, actually if you ask somebody what is a gene they would only have a vague idea they think it's something to do with what we inherit or what we pass on and you can have good or bad genes but it turns out genes are units of information and we have many thousands of them so uh, for example uh, humans this is an overestimate i need to revise this slide but humans have about 20 to 25000 genes and it's about the same number of genes as uh something which is a worm this is a worm that has about 20000 genes and this arabidopsis thaliana is a weed and you know that grows you know <laughs> sort of almost without limit and it has about 20000 genes so we don't have more genes than a worm or a weed uh so that should give us some uh perspective on on where we stand in life now <clears throat> as i told you genes are units of information and by and large they contain information uh, about making proteins not just how to make them but also when to make them and how much to make them so there's a lot of control there but fundamentally each gene codes for information uh, to make proteins there are also some protein genes which don't code for proteins they're called non-coding genes um, but uh, i won't talk about that today now if you look at proteins they're long chains they're like polymers with different types of chemical groups attached to them so there are about 20 different types of building blocks called amino acids and you can string them together in a particular order and that's what a protein is and 
uh, you can represent them in, an, in the English alphabet, since there are only 20 or so amino acids, uh, you can represent them by single letters with, uh, with the, in the English alphabet. Now, if you look at what genes look like, this, uh, what proteins look like, they can come in many different shapes. And I particularly want you to notice this one because this structure of this protein collagen was discovered right here in Madras because it was discovered by G. N. Ramachandran at the when he was working at the University of Madras. And it was a very famous discovery. And this is a protein called hemoglobin which takes oxygen from our lungs through our blood to our tissues uh, where it's needed. Uh, you're able to see the screen because of this protein which is, sits in the membranes of the cells in your eyes and it can detect light and it's called rhodopsin. So this is just to show you proteins come in many different shapes and carry out many different functions but they're all made using information in a gene that codes for that particular protein. So for each protein, there is a particular gene, and we have thousands of them. So how, do, how, how can that work? Now DNA, as you know, is a double helix, and it has four types of building blocks called bases. So you can think of DNA as a sentence written in a four-letter alphabet. Now what happens is, Parts of DNA that code for a gene are copied into a temporary molecule called mRNA. Now, M nobody knew about mRNA three years ago, I mean, I mean except for scientists. Uh, but of course, everybody now knows about mRNA because of the COVID vaccines. You know, the mRNA vaccines are some of the best vaccines against uh, COVID-19. And what that mRNA is is simply a, a stretch of RNA that codes for the spike protein of the coronavirus. And your body uses that mRNA to make the spike protein. That's how you make the immune response. And then from this mRNA, you have to go to make a protein. But remember, there are four types of bases here, but there are 20 types of amino acids here. So you're going from a four-letter alphabet to a 20-letter alphabet. And the question is, how is that done? Well, what the cell does is it reads groups of three of these bases at one time, and each of those groups of three codes for an amino acid. So if you only had a one-to-one, -one, you'd only be able to make four amino acids. But if you had two, you'd have four times four, or 16, which is still not enough. But if you had read, read them three at a time, then you had plenty of redundancy to code, code for uh, amino acids. Now this doesn't happen, uh, and the way that happens is that there's a molecule called tRNA which recognizes these three bases on the mRNA and brings along uh, the right amino acid. There's a different tRNA which recognizes the next group of three bases, brings in a different amino acid, and so on. Now this doesn't happen by itself. Rather, when people were trying to find out where proteins were made in the cell, they found that the proteins localized in these blobs uh, in the cell, and when they isolated these blobs, they found there were particles which all looked about the same, but had two parts. If you look, each one has a large and a small part. You can look at all of them and see they, they consist of a large and small subunit. These particles were called ribosomes, and that's the name we've used uh, ever since. And the ribosomes are amazingly complex. So for example, uh, this is uh, the ribosomes from bacteria. They have about 50 proteins and very large pieces of RNA. It's about two-thirds RNA itself. And in humans, it's much bigger. There are about 80 proteins. and uh, very large pieces of RNA that make an even bigger uh, ribosome. But they all consist of these two subunits. Now, many years, many decades of biochemistry um, led scientists to figure out that the small subunit binds mRNA, which has that genetic information. Remember, mRNA is a copy 
of a particular section of DNA which contains that genetic information. And then the ribosome has slots in it for the tRNA molecules. And it figures out where to put the first tRNA, and then it um, brings in the second tRNA with the second amino acid, and then it links the first and second amino acid and moves, and then a third tRNA can come in and deliver the third amino acid. So the ribosome is basically stitching together the amino acids to make the protein, but the amino acids are only from the tRNAs that correspond to the code. So it's reading the code and making, bringing in the appropriate tRNAs which bring in the appropriate amino acids. And this is how uh, proteins uh, are made by the ribosome. So I want to switch to how I got into uh, ribosomes. I said to you that throughout the book, there's a, you'll see that there's a feeling of being an outsider. The first time I was an outsider was when I went from Chidambaram to Baroda at the age of three. And I still remember my first memory of going to Baroda uh, was standing at a playground and not understanding anything that anybody was saying. All the children were playing and I couldn't understand a word they said because at that time I only spoke Tamil. So um, the other feeling of an outsider is I went to a co-educational school but when I was in third grade, the nuns who ran the school converted it to a girls' school. So as I went on from third to fourth to fifth, you know, boys would leave, but no new boys were admitted. So when I was in uh, sort of, this is I think 10th standard, you can see there are about five or six boys scattered around near the edges in a, in a class of girls. So I was a you know, minority and outsider in my own school as well, you know, so that was uh, another interesting thing. So then, as, as you know, I graduated in physics from the University of Baroda, and, uh, and at the age of 19, I went off to do a PhD uh, in physics in Ohio. And uh, this is where I spent uh, five years of my life, and I like to joke that the only a uh, really productive thing I did in those five years was that I met and married my wife. Uh, so, um, and so what was the problem? Well, you know, when, when I looked at physics, I had no trouble taking exams, you know. I, I did fine in my uh, coursework and exams in physics. But when I started doing research, uh, I realized the problems in physics are very hard. I don't mean exam type problems. I mean making real uh, advances in physics uh, seemed very hard because physics is quite a mature field and th there have been very few really big breakthroughs in the, in the last few uh, decades and um, I didn't want to spend my life doing boring calculations uh, that didn't amount to anything but then when I looked at biology I found that almost every issue of Scientific American uh, had major breakthroughs and they, uh, many physicists have made this transition from physics to biology. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should uh, switch to biology because it seems not only at a very exciting stage, but it also seemed like, you know, or ordinary people like myself uh, could make a good contribution. Whereas I, I felt you had to be perhaps, you know, exceptionally uh, brilliant to make a breakthrough uh, in physics. So anyway, I, I thought of doing a postdoc because I was already getting a PhD, but I didn't know any biology. So I decided to go to uh, graduate school all over again in biology. And by that time, I had just, I had been married only a year earlier, and uh, I had a stepdaughter who was six years old, and my son was born and he was only six weeks old. So with these two children uh, and my wife, uh, we basically, I drove a, a truck with all our uh, possessions uh, from Ohio to uh, San Diego, where uh, I spent two years learning biology at this University of California in uh, San Diego. And uh, 
By the end of the two years, though, I had learned quite a lot of biology, uh, including some very comical uh, mistakes that you make when you don't know anything. And I'd taken undergraduate courses, even though I had a PhD. I, I, in my first year, I took undergraduate courses in biology, not just graduate courses, uh, because I didn't know anything, and I had to start at the beginning. Uh, but at the end of two years, I felt I had learned enough biology to actually do lab work and to do research. And then I thought, maybe I don't need a second PhD, you know, work another few years to get a second piece of paper uh, saying I, I have a PhD. And at the time, I noticed an article from uh, two professors at Yale uh, on the ribosome using a physical technique. And one of them was somebody who had offered me a postdoctoral fellowship uh, two years earlier, but I had declined, saying I'm, I, I'm not ready for a postdoc. Uh, but but then I wrote to him and I said, look, you know, you were interested in me two years ago when I didn't know anything. And maybe uh, now that I've learned some biology, I might actually be more useful to you. And he wrote to me and he introduced me to his uh, colleague, Peter Moore, and they offered me a postdoctoral fellowship. So two years after I moved from uh, Ohio to uh, San Diego, again, now my son was two years old and uh, we uh, all packed up and moved again uh, to, across the country to the East Coast where I moved to uh, Yale University. And at Yale University, uh, I worked under uh, this man, Peter Moore, who was actually Jim Watson's graduate student. And Watson is known for DNA, but his lab also pioneered a lot of the early work on ribosomes. So many of the early ribosome researchers came out of Jim Watson's lab, including uh, my professor, Peter Moore. And we were looking to see where, how the proteins in the small subunit were arranged. And that's what I spent three and a half years doing before I got a, finally ended up getting a job. Initially, I, by the way, I applied for 50 uh, job applications and didn't get a single interview. And in the end, I, I got a, a job that wasn't very satisfactory, and then I had to move a year later and so on. And that's all described uh, in the book. But moving forward a few years, it struck me that you know, if you want to understand something in detail, you have to know its atomic structure. And I'll explain why. For example, if you didn't know anything about a car, and you didn't know any, what it looked like in detail, uh, from far away it might just look like a dot that's moving around. Now, if you get closer, you start to see that it has a shape and it has lights, and you know, you learn something about a car, and maybe you learn that it uh, consumes gasoline, uh, or nowadays electricity, and generates power, and uh, generates pollutants, and carbon dioxide, and so on. Now, if you look at a car in more detail, you start to see it has four wheels and an engine that maybe delivers power, and maybe a steering wheel that allows it to uh, go in a certain direction. But you still wouldn't understand a car. But if you look at a car in great detail, and you understand how everything is put together, how the engine has pistons that move up and down, and you know there's an ignition that fires a, a fuel mixture, and the power generated by the piston is transmitted to a crank which turns the wheels, then you start to understand how a car actually works. So you have to, you have to be able to visualize things in sufficient detail in order to understand how things work. And the same is true for molecules. In fact, even from the very first structure of a molecule, which was sodium chloride, we actually learned something from the structure. Now, molecules, I mean, the ribosome is a very large complex. It's, you know, half a million atoms. But it's very small by everyday standards. And the question is, how do you how do you visualize detail in something that is very small? So normally, if you have an object, you would put a lens in front of it. And what the lens would do is collect s scattered rays from the object and recombine them into an image. In fact, all of you are doing that now through the lens in your eyes. It's combining scattered rays from the object 
and, and recombining them into an image on your retina. Now, if the image is magnified, then of course you can see more detail, and that's where our microscope uh, works. But if you um, have a molecule, the problem with molecules is they're too small even to be seen by a light microscope because of a law in physics which has to do with the wavelength of light. The wavelength of light is much larger than the distance between the atoms in a molecule. So in order to determine the structure of molecules, a, a, a classical technique was X-ray crystallography where you persuade the molecules to form three-dimensional stacks, which is to say three, very regular three-dimensional arrangements, which is what a crystal is. And you then take the crystal and hit it with an X-ray beam, and the crystal then scatters the X-rays. Now, what you can do is you can recombine these scattered X-rays in a computer, which is essentially what a lens is doing. It's recombining the scattered rays. And, but, but since there's no good lens for X-rays, you effectively measure the scattered rays with a detector and recombine them in a computer. And when you do that, you get effectively a three-dimensional image of the molecule. And that's how structures were determined. Now, I didn't know anything about this technique called X-ray crystallography. So I went away on a one-year leave of absence, a sabbatical, uh, from the United States to Cambridge, which is where this technique had been developed in the 1950s. And the director at the time uh, was a very famous man, Aaron Klug, uh, who was a Nobel laureate at the time, and he later went on to become uh, president of the Royal Society. Now, when I uh, wrote to him, I, nobody, you know, I was not a particularly known scientist. A few people in my field knew me, but luckily he didn't throw my letter into the waste paper basket, but he, he knew about my work, and so he liked me enough to sponsor me for a sabbatical, and I, uh, sponsored me for a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is a, quite a prestigious fellowship, often given to authors and uh, writers and others. Anyway, so I went there to learn crystallography, and when I came back I thought, well maybe it's possible to do the structure of something even very large, like the ribosome. Now, this person, Ara Yonat, uh, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize, had uh, worked with Heinz Gunther Wittmann, who was the director of a ribosome institute in Berlin. And they had obtained crystals of the large subunit. So this is the large subunit, and they obtained crystals of that in 1980. And then, uh, a few years later, another group headed by Maria Garber in Russia uh, obtained crystals of the small subunit as well as the entire uh, ribosome. So this was all done around 1980 to 1985 or so. But 15 years later, there was still no good progress uh, on the ribosome. So I decided that after some meetings at which it looked like the Yonat group was stalled, uh, I decided that maybe I should at try attacking the small subunit of the ribosome. And uh, this, is, this was my lab at the University of Utah, and I persuaded these two graduate students, Bill Clemens, who's now a professor at Caltech, and uh, John McCutcheon, who's now a professor at uh, Arizona State University, uh, that, you know, working on the small subunit of the ribosome, which was still a very large molecule, uh, to, uh, that, that it was a good idea for a PhD project. And since they didn't know anything about crystallography or the ribosome, they thought it was a great idea. And this tells you that sometimes it's better not to know anything, you know, because then you, if you know too much, you think, it, you realize how difficult it is. If you don't know anything, you just say, okay, it's, uh, you know, sure, I'll give it a try. And so that's what they did. And, and um, I, I like to joke that, see, this, this is me when I was working in the lab. That's, that's my bicycle, which I still have. And I'm wearing gloves, which shows I was the only one actually doing any lab work when this picture was taken. And uh, I also like to joke that this was in my Bin Laden days, 
you know, because I, I had to shave it off after 9-11 because I kept getting stopped at airports all the time. <laughs> so, um, I thought that, you know, this 30th subunit would be a quiet niche for me because Ada Yonat was working on the large subunit and the Yale group started to also work on the large subunit. But suddenly Ada also started to work on the small subunit. In fact, she switched. And so I suddenly found myself in the middle of a four-way race because those Russians who had crystallized the whole ribosome went to work for a very famous uh, ribosome biochemist in California, Harry Mahler, uh, who also recruited a sp superb crystallographer who actually figured out the, the way to uh, get structures from these large RNA molecules. And my former mentor, Peter Moore, uh, had suddenly become a kind of rival or a competitor of mine. So, uh, you know, so it was suddenly a very tense period. Now, the thing that you shouldn't do when you're uh, in the middle of a race is wa waste time. And uh, instead, what I did was to move across to a different continent right in the middle of a race. So we do think that was a very foolish thing to do, uh, but luckily it worked out. Uh, and the reason I moved is I wanted to work on the whole ribosome structure, but I had no idea how long it would take. And I, I needed stable funding because, you know, people like Ada Yonat had been working by then for almost 15 uh, or 17 years, and they had still not made the big breakthrough. And so I didn't know how long it would take even for us to get the first preliminary structure. And I also thought, you know, the MRC lab where I worked, I've gone there to learn crystallography. And the reason I've gone there is they had a lot of experts in the crystallography. So, you know, I thought since this was a very tough problem, if I had experts nearby, uh, then I could get help from them, you know, and get advice from them. It's a little bit like this, you know, if you just want to uh, drive to Aria, you can, you can do that, you know, it's not a big problem. But let's say you wanted to drive across the Sahara Desert, then you'd better take along somebody who understands car mechanics and, and things like that if it breaks down, because you're now pushing the limits of your, your vehicle, right? So, and then the final thing is that it's an institution with a long tradition of tackling hard problems. They won two more Nobel Prizes in the last five years, so they're now up to 17 or something uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, including for a new structural technique called cryo-EM. And it's a place where they don't care how many papers you publish, it's more about the uh, quality of the papers you publish. So Fred Sanger, so Fred Sanger who won two Nobel Prizes, only had about 40 papers or so, if you look at him and an H index of 18, which is not very high, you know, so, um, so that's the sort of place it is. So anyway, I th then uh, decided in the middle of this race to move from uh, Utah, which is in the western U.S., uh, to Cambridge, England. And you, you'll notice that, you know, in all these moves, my wife has very patiently moved along with me, sometimes with very young children. And when I decided to move to Cambridge, and I had to accept a 50% pay cut uh, to move to England because of the salary difference between England and Utah, and the cost of living in England was actually much higher than in Utah, so it was, it was quite financially quite a big hit. And I, I told my wife all this, and she said, okay, I'll move if it's important for your work, but I want to tell you one thing. This is the last time I'm going to move. So, <laughs> and so in, now I get lots of, you know, in the last 20 years, I've had lots of offers from the United States, you know, asking me to come back, uh, often probably with much higher salaries. Uh, but every time the conversation only lasts about, you know, two seconds, because there's only one word, which is no. You know, and then, so, so I've, I've been in Cambridge all along, but I, I have to say I very much enjoy uh, working there. So anyway, the other thing you heard about uh, from Mr. Stevens about Stephen about synchrotrons, and uh, you know synchrotrons are large sources of X-rays, but they're situated in different places. So here we are in Cambridge. 
We had to go to synchrotrons in France, in the north of England, in Brookhaven, which is in, near New York, and in Chicago. So I like to joke, and these, this is what these synchrotrons look like. They're large particle accelerators, which generate very powerful uh, beams of x-rays. And I like to joke that you could join the ribosome lab and see the world, but of course, they only see the world synchrotrons. They don't actually see them. You know, they're not going to listen to jazz in Chicago or going skiing uh, in Grenoble because they're working all the time. And uh, essentially, this is what they see. This is a synchrotron instrument. This pipe here brings this X-ray beam, and your crystal is usually held here, and it's kept cold by a stream of very cold nitrogen. And this is the detector that detects the uh, X -ray, uh, uh, scattered X-rays. So if the experiment all works, then you end up getting a molecular structure. And uh, almost simultaneously, within uh, uh, roughly a month, a month or two of each other, uh, the Yale group, and then soon afterwards we, uh, published the structure of the large and small uh, subunit of the ribosome. And these structures immediately answered a particular puzzle, which is, you know, the ribosome itself, as I told you, is made of RNA and proteins, but the ribosome is the machine that makes proteins. So if it itself is made of proteins, how did the ribosome even get started? And the first idea about this was given by Francis Crick a long time ago, in the late 50s, when ribosomes were first discovered. And he said that maybe the first ribosomes didn't have any proteins. They only consisted of RNA. And what we find is that the key parts of the ribosome, the parts that bind mRNA and the parts that stitch together the amino acids, all those critical parts of the ribosome consist entirely of RNA. And the proteins, which are shown in gray here, are mostly on the outside of the ribosome. And so it, it does suggest that the, originally the ribosome was an RNA molecule and gradually proteins were added to itself uh, to perhaps make it more efficient and more, uh, you know, uh, re you know s being able to regulate it and so on. And then a few years later, we saw the structure of the entire ribosome. This structure has about half a million atoms. So at the time, it was the, one of the largest uh, structures to be solved by crystallography, but now using newer methods, uh, people have solved much larger uh, structures. And uh, as soon as the structures of the ribosome came about, we could quickly solve structures of the ribosome with antibiotics bound to it. Now, many antibiotics uh, work by binding to bacterial ribosomes, but they don't bind our ribosomes so well. And so they preferentially inhibit the growth of bacteria or kill them. And so um, compounds like erythromycin or streptomycin or tetracycline, these are all uh, ribosomal antibiotics. And so um, we were able to solve these and the hope is that you can use these structures to try and design uh, better antibiotics. So when the structures of the ribosome came out, uh, they were a big deal in the science community because, uh, you know, people had been waiting for 40 years to, to see what a ribosome looked like. And so suddenly people realized that maybe the ribosome structures would be in the running for very big prizes. And this led to all sorts of po politics in the ribosome uh, field. And, you know, the same group of scientists were going around all over the world giving talks. And, uh, you know, it almost became like a p political campaign, you know, because, you know, you're trying to sort of say, you know, look at my work, you know, etc. And, you know, and, and, and part of the reason is, uh, you know, in politics, only one, there's only one winner, but in, in the Nobel, you can have up to three winners. But there were more than three people who had contributed to the ribosome field. So it was... You know, you, you wondered when the music stopped, whether you'd be in one of the chairs, you know, uh, that were left. So, uh, so uh, it was almost like a political campaign. And suddenly, you know, I started getting invitations to speak in meetings in Sweden. 
And of course, you know, I'm not naive. I knew what this was about. Uh, they're not. They're not blatant about it because they make it as part of a symposium. But in the symposium, they always invite people whom they're looking at, you know, to see, uh, you know, how good is their work, what's this person like, etc. You know, and, and so they're doing their homework. And so, you, you know, it's almost like being in an audition. You know, you're you're auditioning for, for the prize, and then and then. Um, during one of those meetings, there's a ribosome Swedish scientist with whom I had a big argument at the, at the banquet at the end of the meeting. And uh, I found out a few months later that he was appointed to the Nobel Committee for Chemistry. So I thought, well, I have absolutely zero chance of getting the Nobel Prize, and I forgot all about it for five years. In fact, after that, I stopped going to Sweden, even if I was invited, because I thought, why should I waste my time? Because I'm not going to be one of the people who gets it. But it shows you the integrity. He was on the committee, but he still voted for me. And in fact, he could have very easily said, well, you know, this Ramakrishnan is a, he's a good scientist, but you know, not quite in the same league as this other fellow. He could have easily done something like that, but it was actually, it shows his uh, integrity. And anyway, I'd given up on the idea of winning, so when I got the phone call, I thought it was some friend of mine trying to play a prank, you know, play a joke on me. So, um, I, I never would have thought, you know, growing up in Baroda, that I would end up with over here in 2009. This is the, this is the long central table. Uh, here there are about, I think, 800 or 1,000 people that are all served simultaneously. Uh, it's, that itself is a kind of orchestration. And uh, you can see here, this is the king of Sweden who's at the center of the center table. And next to him is, this, uh, is Ada Jonat. And this is me, and this is the Crown Princess Victoria, and this is Tom Stites. So Stites, I, and Jonat were, shared the Nobel Prize. So we're next to here. And over here uh, is my wife, Vera, uh, talking to the German uh, vice, uh, vice Chancellor, which is to say the Vice President, sort of. And uh, anyway, the, this was all fine. Now, of course, the Nobels are given for physics, chemistry, physiology, and medicine, literature, and so on, and, and economics. Uh, but the newspapers realized that that year, uh, the really important prize was the ribosome, and not the uh, much more than the other prizes. And the reason I say that is because the front page of the newspapers uh, was, was this. So clearly, uh, it, they had recognized that the ribosome was important, and it had nothing to do with the fact that this Princess Victoria uh, was sitting in the middle of the photograph. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so there we are. And uh, I want to finally say that, look, uh, I, I talk about this and, you know, I, uh, I've been awarded a Nobel Prize, but really science is very much a team effort, you know. Uh, and these are all the people, you know, starting with those two graduate students in Utah who started the project. And Bill Clemens actually moved with me to England. And uh, th so all these people uh, went through my lab. And this is the lab up to 2009. And of course, I've had many more people uh, since then. And often, they're the ones who come up with ideas. Certainly, they're the ones who make things work. You know, and, and so uh, you have to realize that the, the director of the lab the, the principal investigator is, is really somebody who has a vision and maybe drives things forward, but could never do it alone. You know, it, it, it requires really brilliant uh, people to, to uh, do it. And so, uh, what, what have I learned from science? So, first of all, scientists are neither Spocks. I, I don't know if you, Star Trek is, I, know, I don't know if Star Trek is popular here, but Spock was this alien who was completely irrational. He had no human emotions, okay? So scientists are not Spocks, and we're also not saints, you know? It's not as if scientists are just doing this for completely altruistic reasons. But we're motivated by lots of different things, like curiosity, or ambition, uh, like a, d a desire to succeed and be first. Uh, we also have egos and insecurities and anxiety, uh, and we have rivalry and competition. Competition can be 
bad for scientists, but it can be good for science because it spurs people to work faster uh, and better. And so uh, there's that. And scientists are motivated by self-interest. So if it's in their self-interest to collaborate, they will collaborate. If it's in their self-interest to compete, they will compete. You know, so it's not one thing or the other. You know, it can be both. Sometimes both at the same time. They'll be even with the same person. They'll be collaborating on one project and competing on a different project. And but scientists are also altruistic. Humans are also altruistic. You know, for example, my father uh, fell down. He's 97 years old. But two years ago, he got dizzy and fainted and fell down in the street and banged his head. And, you know, he was sort of unconscious, but lots of people suddenly gathered and went to help him and then called the ambulance, somebody called the ambulance and so on. They didn't have to do that. They're not getting anything from them. But it shows you that humans have that altruistic thing. It's what made us successful as a species. And so many people also helped me. Uh, for example, many people gave me advice uh, they provided uh, reagents that I couldn't buy, you know, special reagents that I needed for my work, and they had made them, and they provided them to be free of cost, and they didn't want to be a co-author, you know, just as an altruistic thing to help a fellow scientist. Uh, many of them gave me technical help, you know, how to do certain things, how to collect data from a particular instrument at a synchrotron and so on. And as I said, often with no expectation of anything. In fact, a good friend of mine synthesized a very special compound that was key to solving the structure, and he didn't want to be a co-author on it. So what about some general lessons? Well, the first thing, if you ask why did my life work out, it's because I kept my options open. So, you know, if I didn't succeed in physics, you know, maybe I could have gotten some you know, mundane job and, and forgotten about research, you know. But, but I thought if I wanted to keep my options open in research, uh, I would change fields, you know, even uh, if it meant learning, going to completely new fields or learning new techniques, like going on sabbatical to learn uh, crystallography. The other is that I've never been afraid to ask for help or for advice, uh, because, no, you know, you, you shouldn't have, uh, what I call false pride. You know, if you don't know something, you should just admit that you don't know it and ask for help. And that's the fastest way to learn something and get, get advice. The other is uh, you should talk to people because many ideas I got were often from random conversations uh, with colleagues and so on. So if you simply isolate yourself, it's not going to be uh, that helpful. Well, of course, you can't spend all your life talking to people. You have to also think hard and you know work hard and be try and be original. And another is everybody has imposter syndrome. So you know, when I went to the MRC on sabbatical, I thought you know uh, these people are all great scientists and I'm just this nobody and maybe they'll realize I'm a complete idiot. You know, and, and so you always have this feeling that you fooled people. And, and they're going to find out one day that you're, you're actually, uh, you know, kind of a fool. And that's called imposter syndrome, and everybody has it. But if you're an outsider, you, you often feel it even more, because you don't feel that you fit into the club. And this often, often happens if you're a minority or a woman in science or, or something like that. And then, of course, science doesn't happen strictly because of your innate talent. You know, it, it, it requires a lot of things, and especially experimental science. These are the four Gs from the German words that Max Perutz used to talk about, which is Geld, Geschick, Geduld, and Gluck. Geld means money, you need funding and resources. And skill means, you know, you need to be trained well and, and have the requisite knowledge. And you need patience. You, you, you can't just give up at the first uh, sign of difficulty. You need to have patience to sort of keep uh, plugging away at it. And finally, you do need luck. You know, people underestimate uh, the importance of luck. In my case, for example, uh, little random ideas, or even, you know, the luck that Aaron Kluge didn't throw away my letter to him and allowed me to do a sabbatical. So there are all kinds of luck that we forget later on 
uh, you know, later on it all becomes, you know, a series of logical steps because of our brilliance. But it isn't actually uh, like that. So I want to conclude finally by showing you a little movie of the ribosome. I hope this works. So, hmm. Well, uh, I'm sorry the movie <laughs> didn't work because I had to transfer it to a, uh, a, a local computer. So I'll leave it right there. But, the, but you can see that movie uh, of the ribosome on YouTube. So if you simply Google my name and ribosome and, tr and movie, uh, then you can probably see that movie of translation uh, on YouTube. So I'll, I'll leave it there and thank you very much. Questions you can ask to the Nobel laureate Professor Vinky Ramakrishnan. Tarpodu, Manavarhulum, Vasavarhulum, Tambaluka Kiri, Yerin, Yerin, Kate Kalam. So the question was that the ribosome is very small, so how can you make a big crystal out of it? Well, first of all, the crystals are not too big, they're about 100 microns, so you can only see the crystals under a light microscope. But uh, the reason you can make a big crystal is because the crystal consists of millions of ribosome atoms, uh, ribosome molecules uh, that are stacked together, so. According to Darwin's, the living beings gradually evolve, evolution theory. I want to know, have you studied the uh, uh, structural function of uh, ribosome and how are living? Because in the instance, slides you showed, uh, you, you showed the ribosome and other uh, living beings plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, but we showed one slide. Yes. I want to know how far uh, in the, do you make comparative study of ribosomes? Have you studied comparatively ribosomes in structure and function in other living beings and yes. other human living beings? Yes. So yes. Genetically, the, I want to know whether it is evolving. The yes. is some That's a very good question. Which is evolving gradually yeah. in the human form. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. So. You know, with crystallography, it was very difficult to study ribosomes from other organisms because it takes many years to get a crystal, and we were actually lucky to get it. But now there's a technique called cryo-electron microscopy, which allows you to get atomic structures even without crystals. And using that method, people have gotten ribosome structures from variety of species, for example, from yeast, from humans, also from plants, from mitochondria, which, is, which are organelles in our cell, which are descendants of bacteria that uh, were absorbed by our cell two billion years ago. And these mitochondria have their own ribosomes, and they're no longer like bacterial ribosomes, even though they're descended from bacteria. They've evolved to be completely different. Uh, from bacterial ribosomes. So we're getting a very good idea of how ribosomes have evolved uh, through, through the ages. Um, uh, some of the scientists uh, in America felt that uh, they were thinking about the ribosomes for comparing to the Vietnam. Now the success of ribosome was proven. Uh, did they change their opinion about the ribosomes after your papers? No, no, sorry, I didn't understand the first part. What, what okay. did you uh, in the early part of this invention, uh, with regard to ribosomes, some of them felt that uh, they, they granted a Vietnam War. Actually, when the Vietnam War was going there, what they felt it, it was mentioned by you in the book. Yes. Now ribosome was proven, the significance of ribosome was proven for you. Yeah. Okay, did they feel the significance of the ribosome? No, I don't think, you know, the science, biological science community, I mean, the Vietnam War was a political thing going on in the background. I don't think it had much to do with this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hello sir. So uh, basically I have a couple of questions. So uh, the first is, is it possible to synthesize proteins in vitro without the use of living cells? Uh, 
the second is the normal is the normal cell ribosome function is uh, similar to cancerous ribosome uh, cells like fun function and uh, uh, is altering ribosome function of uh, cancerous cells uh, as are possible um, so yes it is possible to make um, proteins outside the cell but not without the ribosome you, you still need the ribosome you can purify ribosomes and you can have what is called an in vitro system that is without cells just in the test tube in fact you can even just add DNA and you can add something that will copy the DNA into RNA and then the ribosomes will be there and you provide all the amino acids and other enzymes uh, so there are in vitro systems to make proteins outside the cell you can also make proteins using organic synthesis using a chemical synthesizer but that is interestingly enough even with today's technology you cannot come even within orders of mag magnitude uh, to a living system that is to say a bio biological system uh, for accuracy and, and, and speed uh, the other question was whether cancer cells have different ribosomes there is some talk that um, some cells may have specialized ribosomes but I don't think that uh, there's really strong evidence that uh, the ribosomes in cancer cells are different from the ribosomes of uh, normal cells. Hi. Hello. This side, so in the same time. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, so what I, uh, I understand this is not exactly your field, uh, like your field of study. Um, I am taking a bit of liberty to ask you this, but uh, what are your views on uh, in, on the general inhibition and consciousness that like uh, in society and some of global south has on uh, genetically modified crops and like I'm, I'm asking this with the recent case of gen, uh, GM mustard in India. So what are your views on it? Yeah. So I'm in general I'm in favor of genetic engineering of crops. The problem that the people, the reason people are opposed to GM crops is because many of the GM crops are produced by big multinational companies and can lead to sort of monopolistic uh, practices for, for crops. But there's no reason why, for example, governments like the Indian government, you know, through and India has many agricultural research labs, why they could not generate their own varieties uh, for use, for example, in India. And the reason that, you, that I think it's a good idea is because you can modify crops so that they're more drought tolerant, they're more pest tolerant so that you don't have to use uh, chemical pesticides or chemical fertilizers, you know. So the, and you can have alter the nutritional value of the crop so that you can make, for example, rice or millet or wheat more nutritious, perhaps higher in protein or have different uh, composition. So there are many possibilities uh, for genetically modified uh, crops that can be actually very beneficial. And you know, the human population uh, is still predicted to increase up, uh, you know, to go up to maybe 10 or 12 billion before it stabilizes. And uh, you know, with weather, climate change, and, and, and drought, and things like that, uh, we really do need to address the food security problem. So I think scientists can play an important role, and it doesn't have to be left to a few multinational companies to do, to do that. Yeah. Hello, sir. First of all, at the outset, I would like to thank you, sir, for giving such a wonderful, nice, and lucid presentation of your uh, noble art. We people sitting in this auditorium are really gifted to look into the, see the lectures and the struggle that you have undergone over the years, right from your childhood up to today's level. So my heartiest congratulations to you, sir. Thank and you. I am also very pleased to talk to you or interact with you. And I have one, one, or, uh, one question, sir. Okay. Sir, in the... Um, separation of the ri ribosomes or in identification of proteins in the ribosomes. 
uh, we normally go in for X-ray diffraction uh, techniques, right? Where in identify yes. different spots, amalgamate them, and then made into different structures. But my question is uh, very simple: Why why cannot we go in for the protein purification techniques, protein analytical techniques like the HPLC analysis yeah. or UPHLC analysis or LCMS like that. Yeah. So that we can get better picture about the types of proteins that are present in either uh, 50 years or in uh, 30 years yeah. like that. And also we can uh, assemble them together, delineate what are the different types of proteins present in, sure. a, given, in a given situation. Yeah, so uh, um, Actually, that was all done before the X-ray structure. So when we when we had the X-ray structure, people already had purified all the proteins using chromatography, just like you say. They had sequenced the proteins, so they even knew what the order of amino acids is. Uh, the simplest explanation is: if you want to know how a ribosome works, you need to understand how these proteins are located in three dimensions. And also the ribosome is two-thirds RNA, so you need to understand how that RNA is folded in three dimensions. What you're saying is, uh, let me give you the car analogy. You know, if you went and simply took a car apart, let's say nobody knew what a car looked like, okay, but somebody came and smashed a car and you got all the parts, but you didn't know how the parts were put together, then you would have no idea how a car worked. You know, you would know what a gas pipe looked like or what a steering wheel looked like. But unless you know how it fits together, all, you know, and how they're all connected inside a car, you won't know how it works. And that, that's the reason for the structure. Yeah, another question, sir, please. How the, uh, your drug action, uh, you, uh, you said that you have got a lot of antibiotics. And how do you feel that these antibiotics uh, uh, would be impacting with the ribosome? In what way it is helpful in going for new drug development? Yeah, so the, the reason, so the, when you know, so it was known for 50 years that these antibiotics attack the ribosome. That, that was known. But what was not known is how they do it. So with the structure, we know exactly where the ri antibiotic binds on the ribosome. And by knowing that and knowing the chemical interactions it makes, you can also figure out what function of the ribosome does the antibiotic stop, okay? So, so you learn a lot about ribosome function and antibiotic action, but then knowing those pockets, you can try and design other molecules that will fit that pocket even better than the natural antibiotic. And that might help overcome resistance, you know, to uh, antibiotics. Yeah. Let him, answer. Let him answer if he can. Yes. Sorry? So, is it possible to modify the structure of ribosomes by drug uh, interaction or the drug protein interaction? It's much harder. To, you know, if you modify the structure of the ribosome, you'll almost invariably make it worse because it has evolved over millions of years. Rather, what you could do is you could modify the antibiotic molecule so it fits the ribosome better. Venki, uh, when you left India in 1971, yes. you would have had some idea of the state of science, at least in those fields that interested you. I mean, if you can look back over that period today, how far have we come uh, in, in terms of uh, advancing in science? I know it's a large question, but whatever insights sure. you provide and what needs so, to be done. So I have to tell you, when I left, I, I was only 19, and I had no real connection uh, with Indian science or Indian scientists. So, uh, and I visited India only a few times uh, in the next 30 years when I lived in the US, only about three times in 30 years, and mostly to visit my parents. Uh, so I don't know much about what went on between 1971 and 2002. But 2002, uh, my first visit to India was to Madras when I was asked to give, Jian Ramachandran had died the year before, and I was asked to give the first Jian Ramachandran Memorial Lecture, which was held, uh, you know, at the Gindi campus uh, of the University of Madras. And that's when I first met Indian scientists. And 
so I, I was favorably impressed by some of them. And on that visit, I also met, went to the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore for a day. And, and I was quite, uh, you know, favorably impressed by uh, what I saw there. Uh, I'm often asked this question, and I would say that India had a period before independence when it produced world-class scientists. For example, C. V. Raman, J. C. Bose, S. N. Bose, Meghnath Saha, uh, Homi Bhava, you know, all of these people, uh, Chan uh, Chandrasekhar, but Chandrasekhar did most of his work abroad. But I'm talking of people who actually worked in India and did world-class science, okay? So there was certainly a tradition of excellence. Now, after independence, it persisted for a while because Nehru was very interested in science. And so he, you know, you know, he funded, you know, helped fund a lot of science institutions and so on. But after a while, it, I, I got the feeling that it sort of stagnated for a while. Then I think, you know, thanks to people like CNI Rao and others uh, who argued for more science funding and, you know, more uh, better facilities, better equipment, uh, things started to improve again. And, you know, they, uh, there's one thing that happened during this time was science also uh, wilted in the famous state universities, for example, you know, Madras University or uh, Bombay University and so on, or even my own university, Baroda University. And science research rather migrated to central universities and, and central institutions, like the Indian Institute of Science or the uh, big central institutes. And so that, I, I think, meant that people who were being educated, like undergraduates and PhD students, were somewhat isolated from where the big, you know, main research was done, and that also wasn't good. And I think, thanks to CNR Rao, uh, this was, there was an attempt to correct it by formulating, uh, forming the ICERs, you know, which are undergraduate and postgraduate institutions which combined education and research in the same institution. So that's a, another optimistic look. But uh, ultimately, there are a number of factors which holds back Indian science. One is funding. You know, funding is, uh, Indian science funding is much lower in terms of uh, fraction of GDP uh, compared to, uh, you know, other sort of advanced science countries, and much lower than China, which has made tremendous, in, you know, investment in science. And it's actually show, showing now, because now you can open up journals and see world-class science published by uh, Chinese scientists. And you don't see that so much from India. You, see, you have pockets of excellence, but not widespread. And another is bureaucracy. You know, it takes a long time to get anything approved. Then you have, you know, all sorts of restrictions on how the money can be used. And even when the money arrives, it takes a long time to even spend it. Uh, then sometimes money is given for big fancy equipment, but there's no money to maintain it. You know, so these are all, you know, drawbacks in the system. And so I think, you know, Indian scientists, I think, are working I would say under a handicap, and you know, if it needs a real commitment from uh, government and from society, society and uh, has to uh, understand why science is important for prosperity. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow in Delhi, actually, um, because there's a direct connection between you know knowledge-based societies and prosperity. So countries like Switzerland or Singapore have almost no raw, raw materials or natural resources, but they're extremely wealthy because they've invested in knowledge and technology. Other countries, for example, African countries or even Russia, are extremely rich in natural resources, but they're not that prosperous economically, you know, because they're not as advanced, you know, scientifically. And so I think there is, um, there is a, a real connection, and 
governments need to have a vision for 10 or 20 years and not about the next election. Thank you for that uh, talk. It was both uh, lucid and very inspiring. Uh, I have a question about the recent uh, developments in the field of artificial intelligence. You know that AlphaGo has, uh, and other packages like that have revolutionized, the, I don't know, I would like to know what you think is the impact of uh, artificial intelligence on the field. Yeah, I think artificial intelligence is going to have a huge field, even in my field of protein structure, molecular structure, AlphaFold uh, is a program using artificial intelligence that given that sequence of amino acids can predict what the three-dimensional structure could look like. And it's made a tremendous advance and lots of biologists are already uh, using it uh, in their studies. Uh, similarly, you know, a lot of things that we now do painstakingly, uh, you know, by writing programs or even visually, uh, can be done routine, you know, faster and possibly better uh, by artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, in genetics, if you, let's say, you know, you have a population, uh, you know, which, which is prone, which has cancer, you know, you can, for example, sequence, you know, uh, thousands or millions of people and then figure out, you know, which among them have which diseases, or propensities and so on. And that could be very, very complicated, but you could, with artificial intelligence, perhaps, uh, you know, tease out what are the important factors uh, that, you know, confer certain traits. So I can see lots of uh, huge uses for artificial intelligence, but it has to be done in a careful way and not sort of taken blindly. What is your uh, reaction to the field, I mean, uh, to, to the development of AI tools? Will they displace people? What do you think about that aspect? Sorry, uh, uh, by reaction to what? Uh, to the fact that they might be displacing people from... I think, you know, it's probably true of, you know, it was, it, that has been true of every technology uh, right from the Industrial Revolution. In fact, what people don't realize is for the first hundred years of the Industrial Revolution, common people were much worse off, okay? They had been thrown out of their jobs, all these weavers and, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, manual workers. Uh, they had been thrown out of jobs uh, because of industrialization. And it's all, it took a hundred years before the prosperity actually improved overall, okay? And uh, so every t disruptive technology will initially make people possibly worse off. But then what will happen is y you'll create new industries and new jobs. So humans will probably end up doing new types of things. You know, so we won't be doing, you know, if something can be done very routinely by a computer, then we won't be doing it. We'll be doing something else, you know. But, what that is, I don't know, but in the, the transition can be quite difficult. I, I, I accept that. Last question, please. Sir, I ask in Tamil, sir. You know, when the Irgal Kodiya, Yelengal Hill, when the Arigalayum Nobel Prize, you know, when the India India Yelengal Hill, when the, how do you panic? You know, when the Arigal Hill, when the like that. Uh, what is your suggestion that uh, today's Indian youngsters, uh, how should they uh, move forward towards uh, science and Nobel Prize? What is your advice on yes. this? So the first advice I would say is don't go, don't aim for a Nobel Prize. Because, because the Nobel Prize is, a, as I tell you, it's a bit like winning a lottery. You know, you would not advise a, a young person to say, you should go up and win the lottery, okay? So that, that, that wouldn't be such good advice. But I think what you should do is you should think about what is, interests you and try to get the best training uh, for that interest, okay? So if you want to go into science, try and acquire a broad background, which means physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics, you know, which are the core foundations of all sciences. So you should try to get a, a good background before you specialize uh, in whatever interests you. And, you know, try to get into the best 
uh, college you can or university you can because that's you'll be surrounded by uh, brighter people your professors might be more knowledgeable and so on so at each stage you have to just try and give yourself the best shot okay that's there's no other there's no magic recipe other than that <laughs> I suppose I'll never let that down. <laughs> uh, how do you see the promotion of pseudoscience in Indian Science Congress? Well, I don't want to get too hung up on the Indian Science Congress, and, and the re I'll tell you why. Indian scientists that I know, for the most part, uh, they don't take the Indian Science Congress all that seriously. It's a, it's an annual meeting. If they're invited, they'll go to it, etc. Most scientists go to specialized meetings where they talk to experts, uh, you know, and they exchange ideas about their work and so on. Uh, so I, I think the Science Congress could improve. Uh, for example, um, they could have. Uh, first of all, it could be smaller. That, that could be one thing. Uh, secondly, you know, there's this big thing about the Prime Minister coming to address it and so on. If they want to do that, it's fine, but they should also have good sessions where young scientists, and especially students, can interact with the uh, main speakers uh, rather than have the main speakers sort of shepherded away as VIPs and so on. So there are a lot of, a lot of small ways in which you can improve it so that you could have uh, quite a good annual sort of mail hour, you know, uh, meeting of, uh, you know, science. But, um, you know, that's something, I, I, I don't think it's so important. I think, you know, if the Science Congress wants to continue, it's fine. They can improve it in lots of ways. Um, if they want my opinion, I'd be happy to give them. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really up to them. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.